This is America, a town of a few thousand in a region of wheat and corn and dairies and little groves. The town is, in our tale, called Gopher Prairie, Minnesota. But its main street is the continuation of main streets everywhere. These are the opening words of a book that changed America. The book's title, Main Street. Its author was Sinclair Lewis, who wrote many books in his lifetime, 23 in all, and went on to win the Nobel Prize, the highest literary award in the world. But Main Street was the thunderclap that changed the literary atmosphere of America. The book was the most sensational event in 20th century American publishing history and sold millions of copies in a dozen languages. Until it was published in 1920, conventional wisdom said that God made the village and the devil made the city. But in Main Street, Lewis destroyed the myth that all goodness and happiness flowed from the small town, portraying small town life as provincial, smug, and dull. And many small town residents across America were stunned and angered by the portrayal. But as he was to do again and again in his books, Sinclair Lewis had touched a responsive nerve in the American middle class. Thousands of people who had fled or felt trapped by life in a small town saw themselves in the pages of Main Street. The book gave a voice to feelings they had been afraid to share. It was a liberation, and America would never be quite the same again. Lewis based Main Street on his memories of the small town in which he was born and raised, Sock Center, Minnesota. At first, the residents of Sock Center were outraged by the book, but they quickly forgave him, and in less than two years, he was welcomed back as the town's chief ornament. Today, Lewis's hometown and the Sinclair Lewis Foundation still honor his memory and works. A museum and interpretive center tell the Sinclair Lewis story. Visitors can also tour the author's boyhood home, restored in authentic detail by the citizens of Sock Center. And when you visit this charming old house, it's like paying a call on the Lewis family, just as their friends and neighbors did in a century gone by. Sinclair Lewis was born in Sock Center, he grew to manhood here, and when he died, it was here that he was buried. He played on the town's streets as a boy, took long walks in the surrounding countryside, and even did some of his writing here. And it was the sum of all these experiences that gave him the background for his work. Sock Center, Minnesota is a pleasant little town with broad, tree-lined streets, a lake, and well-kept homes and is located in the heart of the state where prairie farmland meets the wooded lake country of the north. Just 30 years before Sinclair Lewis was born, the land was populated by tribes of the Chippewa and Sioux, whose culture stressed living in harmony with nature rather than technology. One of the first pioneers in the region was Edwin Whitefield, an artist and writer who came here in 1854. A year later, covered wagons full of New England Yankees began to arrive. In 1857, another settler, local legend Alexander Moore, staked out the town site of Sauk Center and began building a dam that fostered the town's commercial and industrial life. But just five years later, in 1862, the Sioux went to war in Minnesota. It was a desperate effort to preserve their tribal lands and, led by Chief Little Crow, became America's bloodiest confrontation between Indians and the white man. At Sauk Center, a fort was constructed to protect the frightened settlers. Soldiers were brought in from the Dakota Territory, but the fort was never attacked. The stockade site is marked today by a bronze plaque embedded in a rock at the corner of 7th and Birch Streets. The village of Sauk Center was incorporated in 1876. Its frontier aspects had all but vanished. Dr. E. J. Lewis, a former Pennsylvania teacher, moved to Sauk Center in 1883 with his wife and two sons. Fred and Claude. Two years later, on February 7, 1885, a third son, Harry Sinclair Lewis, was born. From the beginning, the boy was dominated by his strict father. His mother, Emma Kermote Lewis, died of tuberculosis in 1891. Sinclair was just six. The following year, his father married Isabel Warner, a woman who was understanding and kind to Sinclair and encouraged his interest in books. But despite her attention, Sinclair's childhood was not a happy one. Growing up, he was picked on by the older boys. As a student, his achievements were undistinguished. In 1902, he graduated from Sauk Center High School, where he had only one friend. His years at Oberlin Academy and Yale University were equally lonely ones. 
this loneliness was to become a dominant factor throughout his whole life. In 1912, Lewis, under the name Tom Graham, became a published novelist with Hike and the Airplane. And two years later, he married Grace Heger. Their son, Wells Lewis, was born in 1917 and was killed in action in World War II. In 1920, Main Street was published and soon became a household word, both in the United States and abroad. The decade that followed saw Lewis as a spokesman for his generation. His books, one after another, were sensations. Using satire and enormous factual detail, they turned a sometimes harsh mirror on America. Main Street became a synonym for stereotypical small-town opinions and attitudes. With the book Babbitt, Lewis gave the English language a new word, one used to describe someone who rigidly conforms to middle-class ideals. In Dodsworth, he created a much happier character, able to pick and choose the best of middle-class values and reject the rest. Elmer Gantry exposed hypocrisy in organized religion. Aerosmith attacked the medical establishment and gave the American public their first real insight into medical research. Surprisingly, even to himself, Lewis's books were overwhelmingly accepted by the very people he criticized. And seemingly, he had struck a chord with middle-class Americans. In 1930, he became the first American winner of the Nobel Prize for Literature. The decision was immediately controversial. But the Swedish Academy had awarded him the prize based on his amazing talent for description and his ability to create new types of people with wit and humor. His critics maintained that he lacked philosophical depth and perspective. And yet, everyone agreed that Sinclair Lewis was a man, a writer, of high ideals and courage, and an original. In the remaining years before his death, Lewis would pen several more novels. Many of them became enormously popular. It Can't Happen Here, Cast Timberlane, and King's Blood Royal, to name a few. But never again would he reach the artistic heights of his earlier works. Lewis was divorced from Grace Heger in 1928. That same year, he married newspaper columnist Dorothy Thompson in London. Their son, Michael, was born in 1930, but the couple was divorced in 1942, again leaving Lewis alone. Dorothy died in Portugal in 1961, while Michael, who had a successful theater career, lived until 1975. Sinclair Lewis paid his final visit to Sauk Center in October of 1947 and died, alone once more, in Italy on January 10, 1951. Main Street was hardly a flattering depiction of small town life, but that was in 1920. People in Sauk Center and other small towns have become more sophisticated since then. Transportation, communication, and new technologies have brought the world to their door. And yet, Sock Center is still a typical small town and retains the essence of small towns everywhere. It is, even now, a kind of living museum of an American institution. No visit would be complete without a tour of the community, just the way Main Street's heroine Carol Kennicott explored Gopher Prairie. The two main business streets are Original Main Street and Sinclair Lewis Avenue. And it's on Main Street, in his father's medical office just above the drugstore, that Sinclair Lewis toiled on some of his books. Lewis also worked for a short time as a night clerk at the Palmer House Hotel, and of course, frequented the public library. Walking west on Sinclair Lewis Avenue, you'll find the Lewis Boyhood Home, which has been declared an official state historic site and a national historic landmark. Behind the home is a carriage house where a young Sinclair found the solitude to do his early writing. And across the street is the house where he was born. Getting completely into the spirit means a visit to the Stone Arch, an old stone railroad bridge where a young Lewis carved his initials. It was, after all, a fine hiding place for smoking and getting away from it all. On the east side of town, about a mile east of Maine, on Sinclair Lewis Avenue, you'll find the grave in which his ashes rest. It was here that they were buried on a cold January day in 1951. As his brother, Dr. Claude Lewis, tipped the urn, a gust of wind carried part of the ashes away, 
it seemed a symbol of the restless quest that had been the life of Sinclair Lewis. Claude Lewis has since died. Fred Lewis preceded his brothers in death. Many people wonder why the man who wrote so scathingly of Main Street would choose to be buried here. Novelist Pearl S. Buck, after visiting the Lewis home, may have had the answer. I found the Lewis home a sober, comfortable, middle-class house with gables and a porch and a neat lawn. And why, I wondered, should that fiery, honest, impatient spirit have come of such a house? What accidental combination of elements produced him? I could only see him bursting out of those walls and out of the town it stood for, loving it so much that he hated it for not being all that he wanted it to be and knew it could be. That was the way he loved his whole country, and that I can understand. But Sinclair Lewis himself may have put it best in an essay written for the 50th anniversary edition of his high school yearbook. He wrote, It was a good time, a good place, and a good preparation for life.